Uh, hi. Back again. Um, hopefully you guys are enjoying the story so far. Um, so just a little recap. Charles Campion, this army guy who was working on some base where some secret government crap was going on, uh, escaped. And he's carrying with him some deadly disease, and he crashed into Bill Hapscombe's Texaco in Arnett, Texas. That's the setup of one of the many stories going on about Stu Redman, who ends up being one of our main characters. Sorry, minor spoiler, but you can tell by the way he spent like literally three pages just describing everything. Um, so yeah, we're on to chapter two. Um, big shout out to my guys Ryder and Logan. Thanks for the shout out. If you want me to say your name at the beginning of every video, um, put me on your story. Share with your friends. You know, I'm just trying to share some good stories with you guys, so thank you. Chapter 2. There's a long rock pier running out into the Atlantic Ocean from the Ogunquit Main Town Beach. It, it, it's a weird name, I'm sorry. Today reminded her of an accusatory gray finger, and when Franny Goldsmith parked her car on the public lot, she could see Jess sitting out at the end of it, just a silhouette in the afternoon sunlight. Gulls wheeled and cried above him, a New England portrait drawn in real life, and she doubted if any gull would dare spoil it by dropping a splat of white doo-doo on Jess Ryder's immaculate blue chambray work shirt. After all, he was a practicing poet. She knew it was Jess because his tent speed was bolted to the iron railing that ran behind the parking attendant's building. Gus, a balding, paunchy town fixture, was coming out to meet her. The fee for visitors was a dollar a car, but he knew Franny lived in town without bothering to look at the resident sticker on the corner of her Volvo's windshield. Fran came here quite a lot. Sure I do, Fran thought. In fact, I got pregnant right down there on the beach, just about 12 feet above the high tide line. Dear Lump, you were conceived on the scenic coast of Maine, 12 feet above the high tide line and 20 yards east of the seawall. X marks the spot. Gus raised his hand towards her, making a peace sign. Your fellow's out at the end of the pier, Miss Goldsmith. Thanks, Gus. How's business? He waved smiling at, smilingly at the parking lot. There were maybe two dozen cars in all, and she could see the blue and white resident stickers on most of them. Not much trade this early, he said. It was June 17th. Wait two weeks and we'll make the town some money. I bet, if you don't embezzle it all. Gus laughed and went back inside. Franny leaned one hand against the warm metal of her car, took off her sneakers, and put on a pair of rubber thongs. She was a tall girl with chestnut hair that fell halfway down the back of the buff-colored shirt she was wearing. Good figure, long legs that long legs that got appreciative glances. Prime stuff was the correct frat house term, she believed. Looky, 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 here comes Nookie. Miss College Girl, 1990. Then she had to laugh at herself, and the laugh was a trifle bitter. You are carrying on, she told herself, as if this was the news of the world. Chapter 6, Hester Prynne begin brings the news of Pearl's impending arrival to Reverend Dibsdale. Dibsdale he wasn't. He was Jess Ryder, age 20, one year younger than our heroine, little Fran. He was a practicing college student undergraduate poet. You could tell by his immaculate blue chambray work shirt. She paused at the edge of the sand, feeling the good heat baking from the soles of her feet even through the rubber's thongs. The silhouette at the far end of the pier was still tossing small rocks in the, into the water. Her thought was partly amusing, but mostly dismaying. He knows what he looks like out there, she thought. Lord Byron, lonely but unafraid. Sitting in lonely solitude and surveying the sea, which leads back, back to where England lies. But I, an exile, may never... Oh, balls! It wasn't so much the thought that disturbed her as what it indicated about her own state of mind. The young man she assumed she loved was sitting out there, and she was standing here character charactering him behind his back. She began to walk out along the pier, picking her way with careful grace over the rocks and crevices. It was an old pier, once part of a breakwater. Now, most of the boats tied up on the southern end of town, where there are three marinas marinas and several hoggy tonk motels that boomed all summer long. She walked slowly, trying her best to cope with the thought that she might have fallen out of love with him in the space of the 11 days that she had known she was a little bit preggers in the war words of Amy Lauder. Well, he had gotten her in that condition, hadn't he? But not alone, that was for sure. And she had been on the pill. That had been the simplest thing in the world. She gone to the campus infirmary, infirmary, told the doctor she was having painful menstruation on all sorts of embarrassing erect I'm going to try, erectations on her skin, and the doctor had written her a prescription. In fact, he had given her a month of freebies. She stopped again, out over the water now, the waves beginning to break toward the beach on her right and left. It occurred to her that the infirmary doctors probably had heard pain, heard about painful menstruation and too many pimples, about as often as druggists heard about how I gotta buy these condoms for my brother, even more often in this day and age. She could have just as easily gone to him and said, give me the pill, I'm gonna fuck. She was of age, why be coy? 
She looked at Jessie's back and sighed. Because coyness gets to be a way of life. She began to walk again. Anyways, the pill hadn't worked. Somebody in the quality control department the jolly old Overhill factory had been asleep at the switch. Either that or she had forgotten a pill and then forgot she had forgotten she'd forgotten. She walked slowly, softly up behind him and laid both hands on his shoulders. Jess, who had been holding his rocks in his left hand and plugging them into Mother Atlantic with his right, let out a scream and lurched off onto his feet. Pebbles scattered everywhere and he almost knocked Franny off the side and into the water. He almost went in himself, head first. She started to giggle helplessly and backed away with her hands over her mouth as he turned furiously around, a well-built young man with black hair, gold-rimmed glasses, and regular features which, to Jess's internal discomfort, would never reflect the sensitivity inside him. You scared the hell out of me, he roared. Oh, Jess, she giggled. Oh, Jess, I'm sorry, but that was funny. It really was. We almost fell in the water, he said, taking a resentful step toward her. She took a step backward to compensate, tripped over a rock, and sat down hard. Her jaws clicked together hard but with her tongue between her teeth. Exquisite pain. And then she stopped giggling as if the sound had been cut off with a knife. The very fact of her sudden silence, you turned me off on my radio, seemed funniest of all and she began to giggle again, in spite of the fact that her tongue was bleeding and tears of pain were streaming from her eyes. Are you okay, Franny? He knelt beside her, concerned. I do love him, she thought with some relief. Good thing for me. Did you hurt yourself, Fran? Only my, my pride, she said, letting him help her up. And I bit my tongue, see? She ran that out for him, expecting to get a smile as a reward, but he frowned. Jesus, Fran, you're li really bleeding. He pulled a handkerchief out of his back pocket and looked at it doubtfully. Then he put it back. The image of the two of them walking hand in hand back to the parking lot came to her. Young lovers under a summer sun, her with his handkerchief stuffed in her, <laughs> stuffed in her mouth. She raises her hand to the smiling benevolent attendant and says, Hunger Guth. She began to giggle again, even though her tongue did hurt and there was a bloody taste in her mouth that was a little nauseating. Look the other way, she said primly. I'm going to be unladylike. Smiling a little, he theatrically covered his eyes. Propped on one arm, she stuck her head off the side of the pier and spat, bright red, ugh, again and again. At last, her mouth seemed to clear, and she looked around him to see, see him peeking through his fingers. I'm sorry, she said. I'm such an asshole. No, Jesse said, obviously meaning yes. Can we get ice cream? You drive. I'll buy. That's a deal. He got to her feet and helped her up. She spat over the side again, bright red. Apprehensively, Fran asked him, I didn't bite off any of it, did I? I don't know. Jess answered pleasantly. Did you swallow a lump? She put a revolted hand to her mouth. That's not funny. No, I'm sorry. You just bit it, Franny. Are there any arteries in a person's tongue? They are walking back along the pier now, hand in hand. She paused every now and again to spit over the side. Bright red. She wasn't going to swallow any of that stuff. Uh-uh, no way. Nope. Good. She squeezed his hand and smiled at him reassuringly. I'm pregnant? Really? That's good. Do you know who I saw in port? He stopped and looked at her. Her, his face suddenly inflexible and very, very careful. It broke her heart to see a little, a little to see the weariness there. Wait, what did you just say? I'm pregnant. She smiled at him brightly and then spat over the side of the pier. Bright red. Big joke, Franny, he said uncertainly. No joke. He kept looking at her. After a while, they started walking again. As they crossed the parking lot, Gus came out and waved to them. Franny waved back. So did Jess. They stopped at the Dairy Queen on US 1. Jess got a Coke and sat, sipping, sipping it thoughtfully behind the Volvo's wheel. Fran made him get <laughs> Fran made him get her a banana boat supreme, and she sat against the door, two feet of seat between them, spooning up nuts and pineapple sauce and Airstaz Dairy Queen ice cream. You know, she said, DQ ice cream is mostly bubbles. Did you know that? Lots of people don't. Jess looked at her and said nothing. Truth, she said, those ice cream machines are really nothing but giant bubble machine. That's how Dairy Queen gets all their ice cream so cheap. We had an off print about it in business theory. There are many ways to defer a feline. Jess looked at her and said nothing. Now, if you want real ice cream, you have to go someplace like a Deering ice cream shop. And that's, she burst into tears. He slid across the seat to her and put her arms around his neck. Put his arms around her neck. Franny, don't do that, please. My banana boat is dripping on me, she said, still weeping. His handkerchief came out again and he mopped her off. By then, her tears had trailed off into sniffles. Banana boat with blood sauce. She said, looking at it with red eyes. I guess I can't eat it anymore. I'm sorry, Jess. Would you throw it away? Sure, he said stiffly. He took it from her, got out, and tossed it in the waste can. He was walking funny, Fran thought, and it was as if he had been hit hit, hit hard down low where it hurt, hurts boys. In a way, she supposed that was just where he had been hit. But if you want to look at it another way, well, that was just about the way she had felt after he had taken her virginity on the beach. She, felt, she had felt like she had a bad case of diaper rash. Only diaper rash didn't make you preggers. He came back and got in. Are you really Fran? Are you really Fran? He asked abruptly. I am really. Well, how did it happen? I thought you had. I thought you were on the pill. Well, what I figure out, 
what I figure is one, somebody in the quality control department of the jolly old overall factory was asleep with the switch when my batch of pills went on by by the conveyor belt. Or two, they're feeding you guys something in the UNH mess hall that builds up sperm. Or three, I forgot to take a pill and have since have forgotten that I forgot. She offered him a hard, thin, sunny smile and he, that he recoiled from just a bit. What are you mad about, Fran? I just asked. Well, to answer your question in a different way, on a warm night in April, it must have been the 12th, 13th, or 14th, you put your penis into my vagina and had an orgasm, thus ejaculating sperm by the millions. Stop it, he said sharply. You don't have to. To what? Outwardly stony, she was dismayed inside. In all our imaginings of how the scene might play, she had never seen it quite like this. To be so mad, he said lamely, I'm not going to run out on you. No, she said more softly. At this point, she could have plucked out, plucked one of his hands off the wheels, held it, and held, healed the breach entirely. But she couldn't make herself do it. He had no business wanting to be comforted, no matter how tested or unconscious his wanting was. She suddenly realized that one way or another, the laughs and the good times were over for a while. That made her want to cry again, and she staved off the tears grimly. She was Franny Goldsmith, Peter Goldsmith's daughter, and she wasn't going to sit in the parking lot of the old gun quit Dairy Queen crying her stupid damn eyes out. What do you want to do? Jess asked, getting out of cigarettes. What do you want to do? He struck a light, and for just a moment, a cigarette smoke raffered it up. She clearly saw a man and boy fighting for control over the same face. Oh, hell, he said. The choice is as I see them, she said. We can get married or keep the baby. We can get, get married or give the baby up. Or we don't get married and I keep the baby. Or, Franny, or we don't get married and I don't keep the baby. Or I could get an abortion. Does that cover anything? To, have I left anything out? Franny, can't we just talk? We are talking, she flashed at him. You had your chance and you said, oh, hell. Your exact words. I've just outlined all the possible choices. Of course, I've had a little bit more time to work up an agenda. You want a cigarette? No, they're bad for the baby. Franny, God damn it! why are you shouting? She asked softly. Because you seem to, so determined to aggravate me as much as you can, Jess said hotly. He controlled himself. I'm sorry, I just can't think of this as my fault. You can't? She looked at him with a cock dive out, and behold, a virgin shall conceive. Do you have to be so goddamn flip? You had the pill, you said. I took you at your word. Was I so wrong? No, you weren't so wrong, but that doesn't change the fact. I guess not, he said gloomily and pitched his cigarette out half-smoked. So what do we do? You keep asking me, Jesse. I just outlined the choices as I see them. I thought you might have some ideas. There's suicide, but I'm not considering it at this point. So pick the other choice you like, and we'll talk about it. Let's get married, he said in a very sudden, a sudden strong voice. He had the air of a man who has decided that the best way to solve the Gordini Gordinian knot problem would, would be to hack right down through the middle of it. Full speed ahead and get the winers below decks. No, she said, I don't want to marry you. It was as if his face was held together by a number of unseen boltons. Each of them had suddenly been loosened a turn and a half. Everything sagged at once. The image was so cruelly comical that she had to rub her wounded tongue against the rough top of, top of her mouth to keep from getting the j giggles again. She didn't want to laugh at Jess. Why not, he asked. Fran, I have to think of my reasons of why not. I'm not going to let you draw me into discussions of my reason why not because right now I don't know. You don't love me, he said sulkily. In most cases... Love and, marriage is, love and marriage are mutually, mutually exclusive states. Pick another choice. He was silent for a long time. He fiddled with a fresh cigarette but didn't light it. At last he said, I can't pick another choice, Franny, because you don't want to discuss this. You want to score points off me. That touched her a little bit. She nodded. Maybe you're right. I've had a few scored off me in the last few weeks. Now you, Jess, you're Joe College all the way. If a mugger came at you with a knife, you'd want to convene a seminar on the spot. Oh, for God's sake. Pick another choice. No, you've got your reasons all figured out. Maybe I need a little time to think, too. Okay, would you take us back to the parking lot? I'll drop you off and do some errands. He gazed at her startled. Franny, I rode my bike all the way down from Portland. I've got a room at a motel outside of town. I thought we were going to spend the weekend together. In your motel room? No, Jess. The situation has changed. You just get back on your tent speeding, bike back to Portland, and you get in touch when you've thought about it a little bit more. No great hurry. Stop riding me, Franny. No, Jess. You were the one that rode me. She jeered in sudden furious anger. And that was when he slapped her lightly backhand on the cheek. He stared at her stunned. I'm sorry, Fran. Accepted, she said colorlessly. Drive on. They didn't talk on the ride back to the public beach parking lot. She sat with her hands folded in her lap, watching the slices of ocean layered between the cottages just west of the seawall. They looked like slum apartments, she thought. Who owned these houses? Most of them shuttered blindly against the summer that would officially begin in less than a week. Professors from MIT, Boston doctors, New York lawyers... These houses weren't the real biggies, the coast estates owned by men who counted their fortunes in seven and eight figures. But when the families who owned them moved in here, the lowest IQ on Shore Road would be Gus the parking attendant. The kids would have ten speeds like Jess's. They would have bored expressions and they would go out with their parents to have lobster dinners and to attend the Elgin Quid Playhouse. They would idle up and down the main street, masquerading after soft summer twilight as street people. She kept looking out at the lovely flashes of cobalt between the crammed together houses, aware that the, her vision was blurring with a new fill of tears. 
the little white cloud that cried. They reached the parking lot and Gus waved. They waved back. I'm sorry I hit you, Franny, Jess said in a subdued voice. I never meant to do that. I know. Are you going back to Portland? I'll stay here tonight and call you in the morning. But it's your decision, Fran. If you decide, you know, that abortion is the thing, I'll scrape up the cash. Pun intended. No, he said. Not at all. He slid across the seat and kissed her chastely. I love you, Fran. I don't believe you do, she thought. But suddenly, suddenly I don't believe it at all. But I'll accept in good grace. I can do that much. All right, she said quietly. It's the Lighthouse Motel. Call if you want. Okay, she slid behind She slid behind the wheel, suddenly feeling very tired. Her tongue ached miserably where she had bitten it. He walked to where his bike was located, locked to the iron railing, and coasted it back to her. Wish you'd call, Fran. She smiled artificially. We'll see. So long, Jess. She put the Volvo in gear, turned around, and drove across the lot to the shore road. She could see Jess standing by his bike yet, the ocean at his back, and for the second time that day, she meant to the accused him of knowing exactly what kind of picture he was making. This time, instead of being irritated, she felt a little bit sad. She drove on, wondering if the ocean would ever look the way it had looked to her before all of this had happened. Her tongue hurt miserably. She opened her window wider and spat, all white and all right this time. She could smell the salt of the ocean strongly, like better tears. Um, so yeah, that's the end of chapter two. Get introduced to another main character, Franny Goldsmith. Um, she's pregnant, so, you know, you got some good stuff on the horizon. That was it. See ya.